It's nice to see you all. I'm, I'm Jeremy. Um, I'm from uh, NASA Goddard. I've been with the uh, Ocean Biology Processing Group since 1999. I think you've already met Sean earlier this morning while I was out. He's been there since 97. He's, yeah, so uh, that's pretty much where we've cut our teeth. So uh, this is my fourth optics class. Usually I come in and try to do a little bit about uh, the satellite end of the house, which I think you've started to touch on already on the syllabus. You should have gotten an introduction from Kurt late last week and started touching all of the algorithms. So what we're doing today is to talk about the process of atmosphere correction. If you can't do this right, there are no algorithms that are going to be meaningful for you. So uh, I'll just give you fair warning. Um, not only do I wander and I'll start sweating, but uh, this is a long one. So my apologies that my introduction to you is going to take you right up to lunchtime. And you know I don't take it personally if you doze off, so that's cool. Uh, but it's a, it, it's a lot of material. So the way I put this together was uh, to give you a little bit of a, a small taste of all of the different components of this. And if you want to learn more or there's something that you missed, well, um, Kurt and Sean and I and a few others uh, spent some time putting this lecture into a NASA technical memo that you can get online. And so it'll have all of the nuts and bolts. And Kurt, jump in when I'm um, misrepresenting something that, uh, that we put down on words. If not, it, uh, if, if you're not into uh, going through that, it also uh, appears on the Ocean Optics book website as well, too. So for the purposes of today, there's really only three things that I want you to take away from it, uh, rather than worrying about all of the details. The first is just to get a sense that this is a, um, a stupidly complex process. Um, and so as you start playing with this data more and more, maybe you go back and you start doing some things on your own, your temptation is going to be to throw up your hands and saying something's not working. This doesn't work in my body of water. That really might be true. Um, our mission is to make the global ocean as approachable as possible. So this will break down at times. And if you can just get enough out of this to start understanding where the pieces are that might be breaking for you, that's great. Um, second of all, there is a bunch of field data and empiricism subtly embedded into all of this. And you should be aware of that because the field data you collect um, or the algorithms that you produce may end up in this process as well. And so having a keen eye for that is also important. And last, we are reliant on a metric crap ton of ancillary data. So not one satellite can do everything right now. If we need mixed layer depth or we need an ozone measurement or we need sea surface pressure, that has to come from somewhere. And anytime you're taking something from somewhere else, you're bringing in their own uncertainties. And you're putting in another assumption. And we're going to kind of keep a scorecard on where all of these ancillary data sources come from and how many are actually involved. So, all right, so that's my preamble. Um, we'll start at the top of the mountain here, where you wouldn't be here if you didn't already know this, but what we're interested in is something dealing with biogeochemistry or physics of the ocean. Why do you do this with a satellite? Um, you just can't be everywhere at all time on a boat, whereas a satellite never sleeps. On top of that, the satellite is a permanent data record. So if it's seeing the whole Earth every two days, which most of these are, you don't have to worry about being out on a boat. And five years could pass, and you come up with a new idea. The data is still there. So you can go back retrospectively and start thinking about your time series. But the problem is, is that these instruments only measure light. They do not scoop into the water and make a concentration measurement. So there is a link between what the satellite is measuring, which is light, and the in-water constituents and their concentrations. And so you've learned this through all of your radio transfer lectures already, that the in-water things that you care about and their concentrations shape the inherent optical properties, which in turn shape the color of the ocean. And that's what the satellite measures. So that's the forward problem. Atmospheric correction is really an inverse problem, because we start here, and then we have to start going backwards. So and you've uh, started getting some of these algorithm tidbits late last week, and then you'll get more and more of them this week, too. But we're working in the inverse right to left here. So what, looking at this another way, the satellite is viewing a spectral light field, but it's at the top of the atmosphere. 
So it's not just the ocean surface. It's not just light reflected off of the ocean. It's everything. It is the absorbing aerosols have a contribution here, clouds, anything in the way is our noise. And so we want to get rid of it. Step one is to take all of the signal that the satellite measures and get rid of as much as we can so all we're left with is what's coming out of the sea surface. Then step two, where you're starting to talk about algorithms, is taking that measurement of color and relating it to whatever geophysical property you actually care about. And uh, as you get into the CDAS lectures and labs uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, you'll learn a little bit more about uh, the spatial and temporal binning of all of this remapping. And so really, at a fundamental level, just three steps in ocean color. Get rid of the atmosphere, get to some geophysical product you care about, and then put it on some grid or temporal scale that you actually um, have interest in. We're talking only about number one today. All right, our governing equation. Ocean color satellites measure top of atmosphere radiance as the T here is for total. It's just the total radiance signal. And in this case, in this equation, all of the radiances are defined at the top of the atmosphere. And so we have a contribution of Rayleigh, molecular scattering. We have the interaction of aerosols. And you think of this as a maritime salt. It could be an urban soot, but aerosols and their interaction with Rayleigh scattering. You have sun glint. You have the background sky radiance. What this is is um, the fact that you have a bright sky that's contributing light back into the path of the uh, satellite view angle that uh, is not what you want. White caps, which uh, Heidi talked about a little bit, or a lot, actually. Heidi, when we get to the white cap section, I'm going to ask you what I can skip. <laughs> so, be good. And then you have the water leaving signal. And so here is basically just a cartoon of all of that, that you have the LW, the water leaving signal that we care about, propagating to the top of the atmosphere and to the satellite instrument. You have the sun rays being reflected um, off of the surface that goes into there. You have Rayleigh, which again, uh, these little ends are intended to represent just any air molecule or aerosol. So it's a hodgepodge. This is not showing up well, but it's intended to give you an idea of the magnitude of all of these contributing factors. So what you have here on a scale from 0 to 1 is the total fraction. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah. Total fraction. So 1 would be 100% contribution. Uh, and I, what is important here is that for the most part, we're only looking from 400 to 800. That's going to be what we talk about today. You'll notice that the water leaving signal is very, very small. And so we'll come back to this, but the problem is, is that we're throwing away 90% or more of the signal to get to what we actually care about here. There is a stronger signal from surface, which is sun glint. There is Rayleigh scattering, and you'll notice from here that Rayleigh can be up to 70%. And if you are to sum all of the atmospheric contributions, which is Rayleigh, aerosols and the aerosols plus really interaction, you're getting this curve, which is the total atmosphere, about 80%. So there's a strong atmospheric signal we have to get rid of. Um, yeah, so we're going to come back to this in a couple of different ways. So let's go back to the equation, and we're going to rewrite it. So instead of everything being defined at the top of the atmosphere, we're taking it down to the sea surface, OK? So the terms for glint for white caps, the F is for foam, and for water leaving reflectances are now defined at the sea surface. L, the sky term is accounted for in the Rayleigh correction, so we're not going to talk about that today. And now you start having diffuse and direct transmittances associated with that. And here's what I mean. There should be a little cartoon popping up. So whatever signal you have at the sea surface gets in some way attenuated as it goes back up to the satellite field of view. We're defining these as in the terms of transmittance, uh, the direct one shown in red here. One particular path connects the source, in this case the sun, to the satellite instrument. And so something like sun glint is a good example of um, a radiometric feature where you were defining it as a point of light bouncing off the sea surface 
and so it is direct transmittance. It's only getting attenuated in its path. Diffuse is when the radiance from all locations in all directions gets scattered multiple times. And so if you're looking at kind of a water leaving distribution that is popping out in different directions, well, you have some angular here, angular radiance here that is bouncing around in the atmosphere and getting popped into the satellite field of view. Uh, you have some that will be direct, but it's basically intended to reflect that you're not just looking at one source. It could be multiple sources that uh, they get attenuated as you go. So that's where the transmittance terms come from. And again, even if I sound like I'm going fast here, you are going to be bombarded with a discussion of every single term in this equation over the course of the next three hours. Sorry, it won't be that long. Uh, so finally, we get down to the governing equation that we're going to spend the rest of the morning on. In this case, we factored out the transmittances, meaning that they appear in a couple of different places. We've now assigned them into a couple of different bins. You have the G and the V, which is diffuse transmission by gases in the viewing direction. The GS is diffuse transmission by atmospheric gases in the sun's direction. And the D stands for uh, diffuse transmission along the viewing path of the sensor. This might seem overcomplicated. In fact, this was one of the biggest conversations that Kurt, Sean, and I had when we were trying to write this all down. It's done for reasons of computational efficiency. So if you're a theoretician, you're going to go back to first principles here. If you're trying to process petabytes of satellite data repeatedly over time, well, you have to make some computational simplifications. And so that's where all of this comes in. My group, the Ocean Biology Processing Group, works with this. So we're going to stick with that one in case you ever are so bold as to dive into the code. And I encourage that. Um, yeah, well, I used to do that. But we're going to follow this and use this effectively as our table of contents for the rest of the talk. So there's one more step here. Is, uh, I, when you were doing your algorithm work and playing with Collins inversion model, my expectation is you were playing with remote sensing reflectances, right? And so the equation that I've shown you so far is in radiance space. So there is one more transformation where we take the radiance space and convert it into remote sensing reflectances. And you'll notice a few other terms pop up that we're going to discuss today as well. So we start here and we want to get here. So the table of contents, as you can see, is going to be pretty long. And we're going to sequentially step through the meaning and derivation of each term in these equations. Now, again, it's not going to be five or six slides on each. It'll just be kind of an amuse-bouche for all of them. But I, you know, keeping in mind, again, the complexity, the empiricism, the field data, and the use of ancillary data, um, hopefully you will get kind of a bird's eye view of why this is as complicated as it is and what we need to do this properly and what might fail and how you can do it better as uh, you take the 20 years of development and refinement, we retire and you move on uh, into um, greener pastures and better algorithms. Okay, so here's the preview. We measure this, we desire that. There's a number of terms that we calculate ahead of time, which is nice. And then there is the biggest problem in atmosphere correction, the one unknown that we have to assign pixel by pixel using a number of assumptions. So we'll stop at top, top of atmosphere, we'll start at top of atmosphere radiance. So this is to beat the horse a little bit more about how big the signal is at the top of the atmosphere and how small the signal is at the sea surface. So this is from an IOCCG report that came out order of 10 years ago. What you're looking at on the right side here are um, a number of top of atmosphere reflectances for various kinds of water. And for the most part, focus on the red and the blue. Uh, the green is a really sediment dominated one. It's uh, common, but it's not super, super common uh, in a global ocean. Over here is the percent of top of the atmosphere reflectances for each of these three cases. 
And again, I'll draw your attention to 10% here, where really what we're looking for is some small fraction. And as you start moving into the red, into the near infrared, that number drops even farther. So if you ever were to become a cloud or an aerosol or a land scientist, you got a ton of signal. If you remain an oceanographer, you have very, very little signal. And this is the problem. Furthermore, because your signal is so small, you have to pay a lot of attention to your instrument calibration. So think of this as kind of the 10 to 1 rule. If we're interested in 10% of our signal, then an error at the top of the atmosphere of, let's say, 5%, 0.5% gets magnified to a 5% error at the sea surface. And so, um, Part of our job at Goddard is dealing with the fact that the ocean is so dark in this discipline that very, very small measurement errors pre-launch or small instrument drift after you've launched can really, really blow up your error bars in your geophysical products. And uh, one of the other hats that I wear there is uh, to work with the pace mission, which uh, isn't dead yet. but it's designing an instrument that has never been designed before, respecting the fact that it has to be super calibrated. And that's been the biggest challenge with all of this. OK, so let's talk about our known terms first. Uh, we're going to get them out of the way. So FP here is an instrument polarization cor correction factor. This is measured pre-launch. So this has to be done carefully, and it has to be done sufficiently robustly so that we can have some confidence it doesn't change with time. And there are ways to adjust it, but it's not a desirable thing to do. Once you're launched, this is not like Hubble, where you spend the space, space shuttle up, or whatever they're flying now, and all of a sudden do a servicing mission. It leaves the dock. It's gone. Other terms are real simple. Cosine of the instrument view angle is here. This is the solar constant in a radiance. And this is just an adjustment for the fact that the sun and the earth are not a constant distance from one another. Any questions on that? Because that's, uh, that's the, the easiest one here. Solar zenith angle. Thanks. Sarah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My typo. So in this case, um, satellite data are usually only processed to about 60 degrees. And so that holds well enough. So think of um, you know, a lot of this. You have a wide swath instrument. And so you're not just looking straight down. You're looking off to the side as well for reasons Ken probably mentioned, but also just because as you go off to the limbs, there's so much extra atmosphere to look at, this whole process starts to break down and become less reliable. So it's like 55 to 60 degrees is where we start losing confidence in it. But the good news is, is you get more overpasses there as well. Yeah. OK, I'll try to keep the energy high here. We're going to talk about molecular scattering next, the LR term. <coughs> How much of this have you already covered? I'm sorry. Have you talked about, uh, you haven't, have you done the me lab yet? Not the me lab, but they've seen. You've seen some of this, OK. OK, so we won't spend a lot of time on what this all means. Just understand that in this case, it is <coughs> excuse me, um, scattering by aerosol, by, uh, sorry, by, by air molecules itself. And in this case, fairly equal in the forward and backward direction um, with a uh, lambda to the minus fourth type uh, exponential uh, power law decay. So 
when you looked at the equation before, there was a capital R. And again, for computational efficiency, what you're seeing now is this being factored into a product of this lowercase r, Rayleigh scattering, diffuse transmission, and that polarization correction factor we already talked about. I'm bringing this up again just to give you a sense of how the whole system works. So the way we operate, uh, and I believe East and Jackson operate similarly, is you may develop and you maintain a single lookup table for that lowercase r term, computed using a standard atmosphere and considering non-absorbing gases, again, non-absorbing gases here, for various sun and viewing geometries. So imagine a big lookup table where you plug in your viewing geometries and you can come up with this LR term. Transmittances are described later here. If we didn't do this, you're going to run into the problem of a lookup table becoming a function of other gases, absorbing gases that affect transmission. And they include ozone, NO2, and water vapor. If we didn't factor out this way, this table would become unwieldy big and inefficient for operational use. So this is just a little aside, but the consequence of doing this is that you do need to make some adjustments in your transmissions, and you need to have some understanding of surface roughness and atmospheric pressure. So the good news is, as Kurt has probably already told you, you can make these calculations very, very accurately. And for the most part, Rayleigh scattering and optical properties are known to less than a quarter of a percent. But they are calculated for a flat ocean. And as you might imagine, the L sky term, which is included in here, starts becoming more cumbersome when you start having a wind-ruffled ocean, where you have any features on the surface here. And so not, we do know our satellite and solar viewing geometries to input into these tables, but we need a proxy for surface roughness. And in that case, we use wind speed. So here's ancillary data product number one, wind speed. We have to get wind speed from somewhere else. Second, there needs to be an adjustment for atmospheric pressure. So the Rayleigh optical thickness is a function of how many molecules there are between the sea surface and the top of the atmosphere. That changes with time. And that is a, uh, can be approximated very well by some knowledge of surface pressure. So remember, I said we're calculating these tables for a standard atmosphere. This is an adjustment to uh, say that not every atmosphere is standard. But again, you, this has to come from somewhere. And right now, this is coming from NSEP, which is a NOAA modeled data product, uh, NASA, NOAA Climate Environmental Prediction Center, I think it is. But again, data coming from somewhere else to influence a calculation that we need to remove because it is up to 60 or 70 percent of the total signal we're getting rid of, which I just say here. And then this is just uh, another. Um, top of atmosphere reflectance magnitude versus the percent contribution of the value here. And so I'll just draw your attention to this red line, which runs from about 50 to 90% on this axis of the signal, again, we are getting rid of. So, yes. See, now, if we're measuring at a rough kilometer here, we are not getting NSEP data or wind speed data at the same spatial resolution as the satellite instrument. And so not only are we getting data from somewhere else, but it's on a slightly different temporal and spatial scale than we need as well, too. And so actually, if Heidi were to re-ask the questions she asked this morning, I'm hoping by the end of this, at least in the context of ocean color, your answer might change in the sense of, can we do some of these things from a passive sensor? And if not, can we Christmas tree up the platform to add other sensors so that we're looking at all of the information we need simultaneously on similar spatial scales? So ask him to do it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
yeah, yeah. Good, right. Playing peril. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, generate the tables. Hmm. Okay, on the transmittances and gases. So uh, just we'll have little check marks on things we're done with. We can come back to them if you want. Otherwise, on to the next one. Uh, this restates, again, what we were talking about before, hopefully a little bit more clearly. Um, there is diffuse transmittance of gases designated by a G in the direction of the sun or the satellite designated by the S or the V. But then there's also the Rayleigh aerosol diffuse transmission um, here as well. So there's a couple of different terms that appear. So to give you a sense of why we have to make these corrections, uh, we're going to talk or we're going to show plots that demonstrate transmittances for the various gases that do ab make absorbing contributions. And so from left to right, we have oxygen and water, ozone and NO2. The x-axis scale is the same for all of them. It runs from 300 to 1,000 nanometers. This is the only plot that, sh over, uh, that shows you some of the satellite bands that we care about. These are for Maris, I think. Modus. Modus, this one? That's, yeah, OK, so Modus at 765. Um, notice that in the case of oxygen and water vapor, there are places where the satellite bands have some small contamination but that, generally speaking, the wavelengths were positioned in a way to avoid these features. But when you start looking at ozone, dead center in the middle of our green bands. So we have to account for this. Notice also that NO2 has an influence in our blue bands. And they behave differently. So this is ozone density. This is NO2 density. Um, they are not homogeneous throughout the atmosphere. And so in the case, uh, you have ozone being very optically thin and fairly high in the atmosphere, but NO2 dense and near the surface. This is, again, just to give you a broader sense of what we're dealing with here is not totally uniform, and not everything behaves the same. But nevertheless, um, are important to remove from the signal. If you do not account for ozone correctly, you can impart order of like 20% difference in your chlorophyll measurement. And so it might seem like nothing, but at the same time, you know, one of those things to factor in the back of your head that we need to keep track of. And we'll talk about the sources for all of this. Um, another thing to note that's nice on this plot too is you can see that there's a latitudinal difference. So where do we get this data? Again, more ancillary data that gets into the system. We get our NO2 from Skiamaki or one of the other instruments that listed there. Ozone from OMI or TOMS instrument. Those, these are all other satellite instruments that we care about. And then water vapor from NSEP. So one more time, we're now relying on ancillary data to make fairly substantial corrections and they're on different spatial and temporal scales than our native ocean color instrument resolution. I will also note, and you'll see, let's jump ahead to the next slide, that we could get ozone, for example, or we could get NO2, for example, from a variety of different places, but they're different. And so the three different colors that show up here, and this is a time series starting in 2005 and going forward about 10 years, from three different, um, two different satellites and one different climatology, you'll notice that while they track each other, they do not match each other. And so getting back to the statement about, you know, this can influence your final chlorophyll retrieval or your inversion model retrieval, this is a source of uncertainty we don't have a good handle on. And 
it's great that these data are available to us, but the ozone community is not doing their work to support ocean color. And so maybe ways that you can help are get engaged with them so that if they knew or had a better understanding of our sensitivities, then that interaction could actually make this process a lot better. Mike. Yep, that's another problem, too. Uh, operationally, you can default to a climatology. It's one of actually the bigger problems that we had with Skiamaki is for their NO2 correction. Uh, different time, different space, and gaps. Um, there were a lot of gaps to fill. And so one of the, you touch on a really good point, which is if there's a gap, we can't proceed. But if you're doing a gap filling technique, you're not necessarily getting great data out of that. You're not making it up per se, but you're kind of making it up. Or if you refer to a climatology for a couple of pixels and not for other pixels, now you're introducing another discontinuity spatially in your measurement. And so, yeah, it's a big challenge, which gets me back to if you could design an instrument on your own, can you envision how to do so where you're doing all of this on the same bird? instead of relying on different data sources coming in. Yeah. Um, it's only required to go down to 350 nanometers, but the way the instrument is being designed, the spectrograph can accommodate going down to 320. And the ozone community at Goddard did do a nice study for us that said they can calculate ozone f using a pace-like instrument to within a fraction of a percent of what they get out of OMI as well. And so the good news is, is we should be able to calculate our own ozone the, at, right at the exact same view angles, footprint, every, um, maybe aggregated to a slightly bigger footprint if we wanted to bump up signal to noise for a specific ozone application. This is in the weeds, but it's for you. The downside is, is there's, it's very, very hard to calibrate an instrument at 320. And th they're struggling at 350 and 360. 320, we, I'm not even sure our center has calibration sources that can do this. And so it's kind of a best effort. But yes. Yep. Yep, and oxygen A will sample all the way through as well, too. So. So it's a step forward. But at the same time, this runs into building one instrument to do everything. I mean, it's kind of like taking a balloon. If you see something pop up on one end and you tackle it and you squeeze it, it just means something's going to pop out somewhere else. <laughs> um, and that's, that's really the calibration games you start playing. Yep. Yes. So a lot of these, yeah, we, we could do. Yep, and then for unfortunately for some of these though, they have varying spectral resolution requirements for the measurement. So for ozone, you really only need three bands to do. For NO2, you need, like you're saying, more of a spectrometer that measures continuously over that feature. But it, to do it correctly, it has to be at almost sub nanometer resolution. So there's going to be a little bit more uncertainty in that calculation as well, too. But it's, again, what you're gaining is the ability to do it yourself so that you're not relying on something else. That said, you're probably still not doing it perfectly. But it's a trade to move forward and beat down some of your uncertainties associated with different temporal and spatial scales. trying and it, it drives the engineering teams nuts because we're asking for things that intellectually or through radio transfer simulations we think we can do 
but then they go back and they say, well, show us the paper, or show us the plots, or show us the data, and it's not always there, <laughs> like you're saying. So. I mean, I, I view it as kind of exciting, and if I can step on a soapbox just really briefly, a lot of the reason that someone <coughs> might think a mission like PACE or a mission like GeoCape or Hesperia, these new ones that are doing things much, much differently, aren't necessary is because there are sensors that can do a lot of this. And if we only care about chlorophyll, well, VIRS can give you chlorophyll, and VIRS is scheduled to go forward for the next 20 years or something like that. But just listening to the dialogue that Heidi and I are having, there's so much more to be learned with this extra information. And so it has been this, over the past couple of months, very interesting to hear the dialogue of, we don't need an advanced mission or advanced missions because we already have everything we need, versus the curiosity of there is so much more out there that people haven't even started to touch yet. That, you know, it's, it's very, it's almost, it's shameful. I mean, it's just, this is, if you care about this kind of stuff, and I don't care whether it's PACE or not, you know, get the message out there that there is so much more to be learned and that what we have is unsatisfactory for now. We, we're taking it as far as it can go in many respects. And so it's time to move on. So you had a question. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious to know about the ozone overhouse, which we use for, like, ozone data. How they provide the data, you know, in the previous how, how we're getting it? For o oh, uh, OMI is the one that we're using now, OMI. Um, and that's on Aura, Sean? OMI, Aura, suddenly? Aura, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, so just so we can move on past this, um, mechanically, so you know how the correction works, is you have a concentration of what you care about in this case. This is a map of ozone from OMI, OMI, and you can see latitudinal dependence here. You have a lookup table that describes um, the uh, absorption characteristics, the spectral absorption characteristics. The product of the two um, will give you a optical depth. And so that optical depth can be converted into a transmittance if you know the geometry that you're looking for. I'm sorry? This? Oh, sorry. This is uh, sun. This is viewing angle of the instrument. Sorry. Okay. So that is that. We will move on to foam and white caps. Heidi, did you go through no, all of the? Okay. Okay. Perfect. So we will move on. All right, on to sun glint. I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to take a little. What's that? <laughs> Great job. That's fine. That looks really boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> White caps are cool. Yeah, I, fi I was. I figured you had pictures and cool things too, which is why I would have gone through this even quicker. <laughs> All right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. 
But it raises an interesting question. So we basically get these maps. And there's some interaction with the ozone community that produces them, but it's not a super strong linkage. And so one of the things we don't really have a good handle on is the answer to your question of, we take this as gospel, but perhaps in their processing, there are places or dynamic ranges of retrievals that are more uncertain than others. And so, um, yeah. Exactly. So it's it's a gap in our knowledge, actually. Yeah, it's a good question. Do you? Yeah. It takes a village to answer these questions. <laughs> right. Well, it's because it's it looks right because it's a climatology, so it's exactly the same. Different measurements, and so the scary part of this is that when when you go out and you're thinking of atmosphere correction, and you're having conversations with your peers on this. What most people are going to think of is the aerosol selection, which we haven't even touched on yet. But now you're seeing how the sausage actually gets made. And so there are decisions being made about what to use and when to use it that are truly affecting your answer. And what's that? 550. 550. Yeah, so the denominator in most of your empirical algorithms and a pretty key one in their inversions. Oh, so yeah, sorry, it's, uh, this is 5%, it runs from 5 to 5% on that plot. Uh, blue is 350 and the green is 500. It is 200. Yeah, so this this is 10 Dobson units from here to here. But a couple percent, when you put it into the denominator of your chlorophyll algorithm in certain parts of the world, is going to translate to a 20 or 30 percent difference in your retrieval. Yeah. Foam and white caps. Done, done, done. That's a gorgeous slide. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, so sun glint. Um, there are only two ocean color satellites, CZCS and CWIFs. Everything else, MODIS, VIRS, MARIS, OLCHI, they are ocean color capable. They are not ocean color satellites. The reason is, is they do not tilt. So, why do we care about tilt? Well, you do not want to stare in the sunlit. There are, well, that's not fair. There is a fringe community inside of ocean color that really likes sunlit. 
We don't care for those people. <laughs> I know, come on. But there's make an instrument design hard. There, there is cool stuff you can do. And actually, Sunglind is great for oil spill detection. Oil spill detection. Yeah. So if you're looking straight down, anything you see in blue here is in a glint pattern and unusable in ocean color. So the equator is here, 30 north and 30 south. Is this a part of the ocean that you might want to study? Where's Moby, Ken? It's like right here. I know, it sucks. You tilt, look how it collapses. You recover a lot back. But that said, there is always some contribution to sun glint, even with a tilting instrument. And so it's a small correction, but it's a correction that we have to make. And so this is subtracted from the total signal fairly early on in processing. We're going to take a longer look at that equation right here. If you're deeply in, in, uh, interested in this, one of the co-authors on the correction is in the back of the room. Um, but what the terms we're looking at here, again, is a solar constant, two different direct transmittances, one in the path of the sun, one in the path of the instruments, and this term LGN, which is the glint radiance normalized to no atmosphere and an F naught of one. So where does this come from? Well, it comes from a study that bases glint contribution as a function of wind speed. And so again, we need wind speed for something else here. Uh, Cox and Monk, 1954, is a seminal paper on that. Uh, wind speed and the geometries of the sensor. What you're looking at here is sensor viewing angle for lines that represent a bunch of different wind speeds and this LGN term, the magnitude of it. As you can see, it's pretty small, but there is a contribution here. Yes? No problem. Which for over which this was calculated from? So, uh, sorry, 2 to 15 meters per second. Yep. But on my amazing, super sexy wind, uh, foam slide, you can see a histogram of global wind speed, too. And the, uh, the median is on the order of 5 or 6 here, too. So we make that correction. Unfortunately, it involves an iteration to do. It's a two-step iteration because you get to these two terms, you, you need to get to these two direct transmittance terms. To do so, you need uh, optical thickness of Rayleigh, which we know from the lookup tables, optical thickness of your aerosols. We don't know that yet. And so there is an iteration where you make an initial guess of your optical thickness you go through the atmosphere correction, well, part of the atmosphere correction process. Um, you come up with a measured or a observed aerosol optical thickness, and then you do that process one more time. Um, there's a bunch of additional logic to uh, prevent an overcorrection here, but generally speaking, you only have to do this twice because this is a small correction and it stabilizes pretty quickly. But again, you're seeing the sausage get made, and there's a lot of this stuff going on. As, a, as an interesting aside, um, when Veers was being developed, um, the entity responsible for the atmosphere correction code, Sean, am I saying this right, was uh, one of the big government contract companies in the Midwest. Um, this is about 15 lines of code. And to get it implemented was like a contract modification of like $250,000. So you're just seeing the sausage get made here. Okay, so the way this works is when you calculate your LGM term, if it's greater than 0 0.05, you mask it out. We're not going to use it. If it's less than 0 0.05, then you remove it from the total signal, and we move on with the processing. And this is just a kind of false color image to show you what sun glint looks like and the resulting retrievals that we would get if you black out everything that's sun glint or clouds. So the 0 0.05 is that your term? Yep, that's Sean. <laughs> it was Mingwa, but you were part of it.
We're getting better at this, or the community is getting much better at this. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, no. Um, you still see it, it's just it's a smaller spatial distribution of where that's required. See with some CZCS, that's it. It was supposed to be. All right, now that you have been sufficiently softened up, we'll get to the good stuff, which is selecting your aerosol model. Our unknown, final unknown in the top expression. There's a lot of concepts that go into this, uh, a small laundry list of them. The tables that we use, single versus multi-scattering in the atmosphere, which we're not going to have time to talk about today, the actual selection of the aerosols, a black pixel assumption, which you may have heard of already, and then observing aerosols, but we won't have time for that either. So, Okay. Aerosol properties can be characterized by two things, particle size, distributions, and a complex index of refraction. So given those two things, and assuming <laughs> spherical particles, aerosol properties can be computed using me theory. And then you can get scattering of phase function, single scattering of beta, and an extinction coefficient, or in this case, beam attenuation. Aerosol optical thickness relates to this extinction coefficient via this equation. This should be largely familiar to you after two weeks, I think. So what we do is we generate a series of aerosol tables for various particle size distributions and various indices of refraction. They are defined by these terms and several other variables that are secondary to this. And these tables get navigated using different uh, viewing and solar geometries. Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah, great. No, that's awesome. Thanks. Okay, so we define each of our aerosol particle size distributions as the sum of two different log normal distributions. One for fine particles. I think of these as more of the urban soot-like particles or biomass burning particles, the small ones. And then coarse particles like 
sea salts, uh, other non-absorbing particles. Note that the fine ones are sometimes absorbing. Just keep that in the back of your head. But this is generally what uh, two different uh, PSDs for aerosols might look like. Uh, if you're really interested, the paper that describes this most recently is at the bottom. Now, you'll notice that there are multiple colors in each of these PSDs. So relative humidity modulates the PSDs because you would think intuitively humidity is going to change your particle size. So for each of these models, they are defined for a series of different relative humidities. How do we know relative humidity? Well, we go back to ancillary data. In this case, it's another NSEP product that we use. Currently, there are 80 aerosol tables in the system for our standard atmosphere correction. There are 10 particle size distributions, and for each of those, there are eight relative humidities. So I'm going to describe two different terms here that we use in this process. The first is the angstrom exponent, which provides an estimator of particle sizes. A high number, I'm sorry, these should be alphas. Um, small particles, a low number of large particles, and it's defined by this equation. Again, it should be fairly familiar. The second one is epsilon. And in this case, it's simple ratio of aerosol radiance at two different ways. Conventionally, they're both in the near infrared. So for CWIFs, it would be 765 and 865. These are the modus wavelengths. And graphically, you can see this ratio, or epsilon, as defined by slope of these different colored lines here. So you have 869 and 748 on each of these axes. The different colors represent different angstrom coefficients, so different particle sizes in the distribution, OK? The black pixel assumption. So we've defined these aerosol tables, but what we're lacking is a mechanism to navigate them. How do we know what these particle size distributions are? How do we know what the aerosol is? We make an assumption. And this has been in our community for a long time. It's called the black pixel assumption. So in the open ocean, you designate water leaving reflectance or water leaving radiances in the near infrared as zero, Bl a black pixel in the near infrared. There's no light there. So near infrared LW is zero. Thus, in the near infrared, say these two wavelengths, this goes to zero. We've computed all of these other terms, and LA plus this interaction term is simply the total minus everything we've computed in the lecture up to date. And so we've defined what the aerosol contribution in two wavelengths ought to be. This restates that. But the question remains, now that we know our near-infrared aerosol contribution, how do we estimate the visible contribution? And then this has been defined uh, and built upon um, a very famous paper, very highly cited from about 30 years ago. OK, so in this case, I'm just going to do a simplification in my terminology. Um, so that combination of LA plus LRA for the rest of this is just going to be LA. Um, we are not going to discuss single to multiple scattering issues that are embedded into this. Um, for simplicity. First step is to select the 10 aerosol tables that match most closely to whatever your NSEP humidity is. So you've narrowed it down from 80 to 10. 